welcome back to the Floyd Memorial Library podcast, where you'll find information on what's going on on the North Fork of Long Island. We'll be focusing on issues and opportunities going on in the community, as well as people and stories from the present and the past. I'm your host, Christopher Bianchi, and for episode nine today, we have Denny Gordon. She has been living in Greenport for quite a while now and has also written a book in 2015 called Village of Immigrants, Latinos in an Emerging America, specifically on the story of Latino immigrants in Greenport, New York. And we talk about the book as well as her time growing up and how she got interested in politics, political science, and some of the influences on her life that directed her in that direction. And she eventually moved to uh, New York and was a political science professor, and she eventually made her way out to the East End. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Denny Gordon. So thank you for coming on the podcast today. I'm (laughs) delighted to do it. So just to start off, can you give us just a little background about yourself? Sure. I was born in Western Massachusetts, in Williamstown, Massachusetts. My father was an English professor at Williams College. He was a Shakespeare scholar. And um, I lived there until I was 11, and he then went to be the Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences at Caltech. So I went, I definitely am a coastal type. I went from Williamstown, Massachusetts, to Pasadena, California. Um, My parents were both Midwesterners from Boulder, Colorado. They sat next to each other in the fifth grade, you know, that kind in (laughs) their school in the early 20th century. Um, But they were comfortable I think they were the kind of people who made a significant transition in, as many people did, in the economic changes that occurred right after, well, somewhat before, but also right after World War II. So they moved from Boulder to Mass? Well, my father went to Yale graduate school, and that was... And then from there to Williams, and they got married and, you know, were were uprooted from their (laughs) Colorado origins. And what about your grandparents? Well, they came from, uh, they were, actually, the, the, the most interesting grandparent is my maternal grandparent, who was a, um, my father's word for it was yeoman in northern England and um, came to this country, I think, just about at the turn of the century. Um, he was an immigrant, he was, um, but he, he prospered. Um, my father kind of dismissed him as, he said, well, really, he's just a bookkeeper. But he became the mayor of Boulder. He was the dry mayor of Boulder. And he had a department store called Earl's. That was his last name. And a ranch where I visited several times as a child and fell off his horses, things like that. Um, My maternal grandmother um, was a... um, a descendant of Jonathan Edwards, uh, who was a great Calvinist figure at the time of the American Revolution. Um, I have thought that that was a wonderful thing for a long time until recently when I figured out that probably somewhere back in my grandmother's lineage, there were slaveholders. Mm-hmm. And it's it's amazing how that kind of realization, you know, strikes you and kind of changes your sense of your yourself, at least it does for me. But I, I have friends for whom that who've had the same reaction, oh, okay. being startled and worried and 
and thinking on the one hand it has nothing to do with me and on the uh -huh. other hand it has everything to do with my place in history so mm -hmm. that's my heritage <laughs> mixed and how was it for you growing up as a child between in Massachusetts and then in California California well I had a I lived in the you know, a very con on a very country road in a very small town in Williamstown. Uh, I was not a, a child with friends because, you know, I was out in the country, sort of. And um, it wasn't a time, you know, we're I was born in 1938. So, you know, in the 40s, people weren't having playdates in the way that they do now <laughs> or have done for many decades since. I think Williamstown was a good place for somebody to grow up. I At that era, I rode my bicycle all over town by myself at eight, I think about eight. But I also went back and forth to California with my parents three or four times because my father had a a sabbatical and then he had a Guggenheim and he always went to the Huntington Library in San Marino, California, where which where the is the sort of second best collection of Shakespeare stuff. <laughs> second to the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington. And we would drive across the country and then drive back and then drive across the country again and then drive <laughs> back. So I had a very peripatetic I mean, I never went to school in the same year, I mean, in subsequent years, until the seventh grade. Every oh, okay. year was a different school until the seventh wow. grade. And after the seventh grade, you... Well, I was, then my father was uh, at, at Caltech, and mm -hmm. I went to a school there, um, first the public school and then a private school, and... Um, I skipped a couple of grades and went to college very early and then came back to the East Coast as the result of that. So, What was your interest in the early part of high school like that you want? What did you want to do? Well, getting ready to go to college. Um, I, I went to a fancy private school. I was a faculty brat sort of kid. And I went to a fancy private school on scholarship. And I, but then the school went only through the ninth grade. And mm -hmm. I did not want to go to the next fancy private school. I had started to have a social conscience and be interested in a larger world. And so I went to the local uh, public school for the 10th grade. And the 10th grade, it, and this was a, a kind of rough school, and mm -hmm. I encountered class differences and racial differences, um, lots of Mexican immigrants in my mm -hmm. school, uh, lots of black kids, and that was very interesting to me, And but I wasn't getting the kind of... Um, intellectual stimulation that I or my parents, particularly my father, expected. I mean, you know, you have the father who's a, a Shakespeare scholar. He's going to think you should be moving along. And <laughs> I wasn't really moving along. And there was a Ford Foundation program that took bright kids and skipped them one or two years. And I went into that. And then uh, from, so I skipped the 11th and 12th grades. I now regret, actually. <laughs> really? This was the precursor of the advanced placement program that every, you know, AP mm -hmm. program that, that, that kids have now. And what your, your father was wanted you to go to college. Well, he just wanted me to, he was worried. There was some publicity at that point that about um, bright kids being bored in high school. That mm -hmm. was, in fact, sort of the the conventional uh, wisdom about the need for something like an advanced placement program mm -hmm. at the time. Um, we're talking, what, 1952, three, something like that. 
and I sort of fit the the category. Um, so, you know, he brought home this these materials about this program and said, "You want to take the test?" And <laughs> I, I was the kind of kid who said, "Sure, I want to take the test." <laughs> and uh, so uh, I skipped two years and I went. You had to go to colleges that they that were part of this program. My father thought I should go to a, a girls' school, that it was enough of a jolt to be skipping two years to, you know, not to go to a co-ed school. I'm oh. not sure he was right, but anyway, so <laughs> I went to Goucher College in Baltimore, and um, I didn't like it a lot, and I went back to California after two years and went to Mills College in California, which was also just girls, but... Um, that was my that was my route and when you started in baltimore or and then even in california at the two colleges were they very strict in terms of what path they wanted you to go on no. in terms of your or it was pretty open no, it was really quite open you had to have this sort of basic general education liberal arts thing which i think has has kind of fallen away, at least in many colleges now. But you know, you had to take a bit of this and a bit of that, and survey courses and <laughs> things like that. And I did that, but I didn't have, you know, I didn't have any science, which mm. I now regret. And I didn't, you know, I didn't have the background of of American and um, European history. Oh. Because those are the things you get in the 11th and 12th grades. Okay. That has been, you know, I have felt woefully undereducated in that area for the rest of my life. But, <laughs> you know, you move on. And while you were at the university, did you become interested in political science? Well, um, another of the strange things about my life is I... I'm a political science professor. I got tenure. I was a full professor, but I've never taken a political science <laughs> course. Um, but I was always interested in politics and in, in political science. I mean, when I was in the fancy private school and we graduated, I was one of the f four or five kids who were going to give little, little talks. And I wanted to give my talk about how this is 1953 about how black people, what we called then Negroes, of course, mm -hmm. um, how, that they, many, most could not vote in the South and that they were beaten when they tried to vote. Mm -hmm. I was terribly upset about this and I wanted to talk about it. And my father, I, I, oh, my history, my teacher said, no, no, you can't do that. You can't talk about that in your mm -hmm. little five minute. And <laughs> I said to my father, you have to fix this for me. He dutifully went down and talked to my teacher and he caved. And I was not allowed to talk about that. But that, that was important in a couple of respects. One was that it really solidified my interest in American politics and, mm -hmm. and maybe the racial aspects of it. And the other thing was that it was sort of the first moment of realizing that my father was not perfect. So, <laughs> so when did you become a professor? Okay. I went to, um, after I went to college, I went, um, I taught in a girls prep school for a couple of years. And then I went, I was still very young. I mean, I was, I had, I was still 19 when I graduated. And um, then I went to law school. It wasn't mm -hmm. teaching English in this girls' prep school was not mm -hmm. enough. So I went to law school at Harvard. And um, when I, I, I was not a good law student and, um, and I wasn't, it was, I wasn't excited about it. Um, when I got out of law school, I went to work in a small firm in I was then by then married. I went to work in a small law firm in Los Angeles, um, sort of going back home. And um, 
first thing was that I flunked the bar exam, and that was terribly, you know, that was <laughs> upsetting. But but also it wasn't right. I wasn't interested in practice, and mm -hmm. I was much more interested in politics and government. And um, so after, what, a year and a half or something of struggling along as a law clerk, which is not really being a clerk, it's being a researcher, and but it's, you know, you don't move beyond being a law clerk until you, <laughs> until you pass the bar exam, and I hadn't done that. But at that point, the uh, federal government was starting um, the Office of Economic Opportunity, which was the federal anti-poverty program, and this was really the first, really the very beginning, 1965. I mean, it was when um, Johnson was supporting voting rights and yes. public accommodations and things like that. And that was very exciting to me. And so I left my job in Los Angeles with the firm and went to work um, for the Office of Economic Opportunity in Washington. And that, that was absolutely wonderful. I felt as though I had discovered you know, what I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I spent a year and a half there. And then I went to New York. I was recruited by um, John Lindsay, the reform mayor of government of New York, um, by his staff. And I went to work on sort of legal policy issues of various sort um, and worked for the Budget Bureau, which was a, a source of of a lot of policy development in the years of the uh, Lindsay administration. It was yeah. a very exciting time. And this was mid 60s or mid yes. to late 60s? Yes. Um, let's see. I went to Washington in, I graduated from law school in 64. I went to Washington in the fall of 64. Five, or maybe it was early 66, I don't know. Um, but then I went to, uh, New, came to New York in, yeah, it was 65, so I came to New York in 67 and have been in New York ever since. And, and I worked for, I worked for the Lindsay administration from 67 to 70 on various like various things that had to do with poverty and and urban development. And at that time in the 60s in New York, there were a lot of issues going on with just poverty in the city and oh yeah, uh, people moving out of the city and leaving. I guess uh, people talk about people leaving and then there not being enough income coming in for the city in terms of taxes and and just yes, kind of maintaining that, uh, this was sort of the beginning of that i mean the real decay of new york city was in the 70s and while I, when i was there in the early when i first arrived and worked on in the city government there wasn't that sense of concern there was a lot of concern about crime. Crime had begun to, street crime had begun to rise in the second half of the 60s, which is mm -hmm. when I was working in the, in the city government. But there wasn't this sense of decay everywhere, which there okay. was in the 70s. Was there any moments previously before you got the job in New York from the 50s or 60s that sticks out to you vividly as an event that happened in the United States that might have had influence on you that had you go more in well, this direction? Yes. Um, the Los Angeles riots of, I think it was the summer of 64, or maybe it was the summer of 65, I'm not sure, but mm -hmm. I remember I was working in the law firm then, and I remember going to a dinner party on a hot night when this was in the middle of the Los Angeles riots, mm -hmm. and and 
black people were being killed and the police were totally out of control. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what am I doing? I, I was working in a, the, a law firm, a very good small litigation law firm. The One of the partners eventually became the um, Secretary of Education for the United States. It was a very good small law firm. So if I was going to like working in a law firm, it would have been there. But they did a bad thing. They, they assigned me to a, an antitrust case, and I did all this you know, legal research and discovery and stuff on this one um, case, which was, um, and I was on the wrong side. It mm -hmm. was a case, an antitrust case uh, um, against Sunkist. Oh, so okay. it was all about the um, citrus industry and in California and elsewhere. And it was, you know, it was the only thing I was doing, mm -hmm. struggling with this, this one case in which I was representing nasty, big sunkist, mm -hmm. and all these little growers were suffering. And I, I thought the combination of that and, you know, the sense I had of the world uh, moving toward a greater recognition of human rights, primarily at that point for black people, civil rights. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, it was a it was a powerful combination. Combination. I remember sitting at this dinner party thinking, why am I at this dinner party? And why am I going to go on Monday morning back to this um, <laughs> the law, job? Law yeah. Office, yeah. And I didn't even care very much more, uh, more about having flunked the bar exam. <laughs> <laughs> so so and then so you were at you were so going forward you were at the Lindsay administration yes in New York until about 70 70 is that right um maybe maybe it was no maybe it was more than that maybe it was 71 or 72 oh, okay. at a certain point I left because I got a um a fellowship at the Harvard Kennedy School to write a book about the um, about sort of a, about the Lindsay administration and reform efforts. I had never written a book. I had no idea about how to write a book, but I, you know, I thought this is a good thing to do, and and uh, it meant a year of you know, being on my own and thinking about some of these issues that I cared about in the city. And that year, it was 72, 73. So I must have worked um, up until late 71 or something, 72, mm -hmm. early 72 in New York. I went and spent the year at Harvard and then and I did write the book. It's called City Limits. And, um, and then I came back to New York and um, I was very interested. I got had gotten more and more interested in the crime issue and the mm -hmm. functions of and performance of the institutions of criminal justice. And that mm -hmm. was really a sort of defining moment um, for the rest of my career. And I, um, I, started with the under the guidance of Ramsey Clark who was a um, an attorney general a US attorney general under Johnson and he was concerned about the um, particularly about the parole system in this country and so he wanted to start this little organization that would study the operations of parole and the effects of parole and um so it, we i he asked me to help and he and i together with with some other people a wonderful guy named herman schwartz who was a law professor at, at um, buffalo um we put together this little organization and i ran that from 
I think 73 to 78, something like okay. that. Um, very modest, but we put out some good reports and, you know, it was, it was, it was a way to move into serious study of a set of institutions that I felt was, you know, very, very important in American mm -hmm. life and, and very flawed. I still think both those things. So then what happened after that? Well, then I went to, from that was a, a local New York organization. And mm -hmm. from that, I became first uh, vice president and then president of, of an organization that no longer exists called the National Council on Crime and Delinquency, mm -hmm. a much bigger, a much bigger arena. Um, that was a very frustrating job. It was, it was hard. It was now a period when there was a lot of reaction to some of the civil rights and civil liberties work that had defined the late 60s where I'd become an adult, really. Mm -hmm. And that was changing in the late 70s. And then in 80, when Reagan was elected, um, there was really a, a crackdown on efforts to reform the criminal justice system. So mm -hmm. the job was very, very difficult running this organization, which was much bigger than anything I'd had. it, And, you know, I had to run budgets and I didn't know anything about budgets. I was not a good executive. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> uh, so I did that for, let's see, I was there from 78 to 82. And then I was very burned out and I wasn't, I wasn't doing it well. And I was disappointed in myself. And then this wonderful opportunity came. I was asked to come just for a year as a visiting professor at City College and to teach political science and criminal justice. Mm -hmm. And wow, you know, that felt <laughs> like a wonderful thing. And I was going to do it for just a year. And that was all I was invited for. And I was sort of it was I was tired and burned out and so I thought I would do this very thing for just a little while mm -hmm. so about six or eight weeks into that job I thought I really love this this is really what I want to keep doing and I don't want to go back into bigger uh, governmental positions and I wasn't sure anybody wanted me to do that anyway <laughs> needed me <laughs> Um, and I certainly was not prepared to, I had taken the bar exam in Washington when I moved to Washington and passed it. So I could have gone on it, gone back to being a lawyer and, or started to really be a lawyer mm -hmm. in New York and I, but I would have had to take the bar and, and I wasn't, I didn't really want to do that. So I went to, so, um, at City College, I liked it, and they liked me, and they moved me after that year into a tenure-track job, and I kept waiting for somebody to say, but you don't have a PhD, <laughs> but nobody ever did. Then I remember when I was up for tenure, I thought, surely somebody's going to say, but she doesn't have a PhD, <laughs> but I was very lucky. Nobody mm -hmm. did. So. And you really, you really enjoyed that, I mean, the time in academia. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I had a very good time. I wasn't, um, you know, the the sort of um, publisher parish thing didn't affect me because mm -hmm. I liked to write and I wrote well enough. So I was mm -hmm. getting published um, easily. So mm -hmm. and I liked teaching. I still like teaching. I have <laughs> three te three students who come on Tuesday mornings one after the other for individual English lessons. It's very different. Sometimes I don't know what I'm doing, but they seem <laughs> to be moving along. So. Nice. Yeah. And then how did you decide to... Greenport. How did Greenport come into... Well, um, I had had a 
summer house in Shelter Island. I had a summer house in Shelter Island for 30, okay. 35 years. Oh, wow. Um, my husband was a um, an economist at the New School for Social Research. He was a, a leftist economist yes. um, of considerable reputation. And we did a lot of traveling, but we also loved being um, out here in we had a, a sort of beat up old farmhouse that we shared with another family in in um, in Shelter Island. Uh, he died at the age of 51 in 1996. Um, but I kept my house in Shelter Island and I got together with somebody who'd been a casual friend um, a former journalist. Well, he was still a journalist then, but he was also a journalism professor. And we stayed with that house. But I became, we both, he was older than I, not a lot, but he was going to retire many years before I did. And, mm -hmm. and we thought about retiring to Shelter Island, and I thought Shelter Island would, would not be very interesting as a place to retire to because what do you do in the winter <laughs> and and Greenport was starting in the 90s to be a much more interesting place to me mm -hmm. anyway and um, so gradually we decided to, to retire essentially to Greenport mm -hmm. and I did it quite gradually I didn't didn't retire and really until um, what 2012 but we 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 built a house here in 2018 at uh, 20 2008 and um i'm very very glad <laughs> of that and when i um when i when i really retired i was so interested in greenport and i also needed to keep doing some of what i had been doing and mm -hmm. enjoyed i really love writing and in fact, I'm now feeling kind of frustrated because I don't do enough of it. Um, <laughs> but Greenport, I thought, was immediately interesting because uh -huh. of its immigration history. Yes. And, I mean, that was just almost instantly uh, something that I wanted to look into. But you said you had the house on Shelter Island mm -hmm. for... 35, 35 years. years but would you when you would come out to the house would you come through oh the... yes we would go through Greenport, Greenport to get to the ferry and it was you know in the we, we bought the house in 69 and um, in the 70s it was kind of a depressed place mm -hmm. I mean Dave Capel the former mayor one of the former mayors yes. once when i was interviewing him by the way he was just wonderful in helping me get oriented enough to greenport to be able to write something about it i mean yes every year for three years i would call him and say could i please have an interview <laughs> and we would spend you know he would give me a couple of hours wow. each time every year for three years wow it was wonderful but at one point or other he described Greenport during the 70s as a dump mm -hmm. and that is a little bit the way we felt about it we sort of would rush from the train to the ferry rushing through this dumpy little town mm -hmm. to go to Green to Shelter yeah. Island but that really st I started to notice changes to that in the early 90s not in the 80s, but the, not in the 80s, the 90s. maybe I wasn't observant enough, but <laughs> I think that it, I think that the changes, significant changes really mm -hmm. were in the early 90s. And, you know, they took the form of having a beautiful new park. I mean, the, you, you probably know that Mitchell's, the restaurant, burned down, I think in 79, 78, 79. Yes. And so then there was this hole in the middle of town, mm -hmm. and there was a competition for figuring out what to do with that. Very clever to have 
sponsored such a thing. Mm -hmm. And it was a time when I think grants were available for um, urban development, even though Greenford is tiny. I mean, it is yeah. urban development. Yes. And so things like, like that um, attracted both of us um, to to Greenport and and it was it was absolutely the right decision. Mm -hmm. So I sold my house in Shelter Island. Shelter Island had become when I first um, had a house in Shelter Island. It was a very quiet, family oriented place, and then it got sort of got discovered by Wall Street. And I have no respect for in some ways for Wall Street, but I didn't really want to be it it was it was not the same kind of feeling and I yeah. that was another reason that I wanted to come to Greenport. And so as kind of... it got fancier and fancier and and I was I remember one time I went to get the newspaper in the middle of the summer at the little place and there was a line of people standing there and in front of me were four guys all in almost identical Bermuda shorts with the Wall Street Journal under their arm and I thought this is not the shelter island that mm -hmm. I came to and uh, yeah and there was just something going on in in Greenport in the 90s that kind of attracted you to yes to... yeah it was really I didn't start thinking about it until maybe 2000 okay. or even even beyond that but I, I had sort of out of the corner of my eye as we went through Greenport I yeah. knew things were changing yeah but it was in the early 2000s that I started to think about Greenport as, as a possible place to mm -hmm. live and and I had no idea about the immigrant aspects of of Greenport mm -hmm. at that point and it wasn't until I actually moved here that that uh, I bu we built our house in um, 2008 ground up um, <laughs> and you know it was at that point that I started to really learn about Greenport mm -hmm. and what an interesting place it was and and how beautiful and wonderful the North Fork was because mm -hmm. I'd always been rushing from, you know, New York to Shelter Island without the kind of attention that the, the North Fork deserves. <laughs> <But> <laughs> no, that's that's really interesting. And then and then you moved into the house in 2008. Mm -hmm. But then you said you've noticed um, immigrants coming to Greenport. But when did that when you decided to write the book Village of Immigrants, Latinos in an Emerging America. Thank you for a little plug. <laughs> <laughs> there are still a few, few copies being purchased, I think mostly by people in the on the North Fork. Um, well, I mean, because I'm interested in this sort of thing, one of the things I did was looking at, at the census data when I when I was observing just on the street that there were lots of Hispanic people mm -hmm. and that they were speaking Spanish and not, you know, they weren't people who'd been here for three or four generations. I was quite surprised to discover in the 2010 uh, census that, um, that something like 33, 34% of of the population identified as Hispanic in the census. Mm -hmm. And I knew that most of those people were, there were a few Puerto Ricans, but most mm -hmm. of them were immigrants. And um, so I just started talking to people and I was very lucky because, well, t two things. One was that I had a wonderful friend who also cleaned my house Mm -hmm. and knew many other people who cleaned houses and who were recently arrived immigrants. And the other thing was that I had met um, through, actually through Dave Capel, the former mayor's mother, I met um, 
uh, Sister Margaret Smythe, who was a local activist nun who took care of and counseled and scolded and um, prayed for all the Hispanic families <laughs> from Riverhead to Orient. Yes. And so she was an incredibly invaluable contact and became a close friend. And, you know, I didn't even need her to, to, to tell somebody you should speak to this woman mm -hmm. because the very fact that I knew her conveyed the kind of authority and the kind of trust that I needed to be able to get people to talk to me. She died in December a year ago, oh. just last year. And when talking with people when you were writing the book, what did you kind of find out about why they there was an attraction of immigrants or specifically Hispanics moving out here? Well, one of the things that um, is indubitably true of American immigration, at least in this era, and probably also in the other, the previous great wave of immigration at the turn of the 20th century, is that people follow their friends and relatives. Yes. And um, it, I mean, it, it turns out that a huge number of um, people who came from this one, who came in the previous wave, came from one part of Italy. I've, I now can't remember the name of this little town but um, but it's also true in uh, Greenport now, a huge number of the recent immigrants from Guatemala come from Palencia. And you know, your your neighbors kind of pave the way. They, mm -hmm. your neighbors and your family. And so that's a pattern that, I mean, the, the fact that People come here and it turns out that there are, you know, they already have 30 relatives or neighbors mm -hmm. who are here. So they don't feel so incredibly out of place as yes. if they come all by themselves. So I think that's that has a great deal to do with. But I, as to why the first people came, I'm not sure. One thing that I have heard over and over, but I'm a little... I'm a little suspicious. It does. I don't have the sources that I feel I should have. Is that um, there was a period when social workers on the other places in the North Fork and maybe west of the North Fork also were sending poor people of whatever race mm -hmm. out here um, uh, because there was housing. And there was housing because there had been this depressed period after World War II when the contracts that the wartime contracts for mm -hmm. boat building, ship building had dried up. Mm -hmm. And so there were lots of vacant houses and yes. apartments and boarding houses and things like that. But I'm not sure what the connection between that and the beginnings of the mm -hmm. Hispanic migration. I, I'm not sure oh, okay. what they are. And do you think the first kind of wave or the influx that came in, was that more in the 90s, you would say? Well, yes, the, I think the first groups, the first group, the first Hispanic immigrants in the late 20th century came from Mexico. Very few come from Mexico now. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, starting, I'm not sure when, maybe the very end of the century or maybe even early, the early 2000s, um, Central American immigrants came. And mm. you know, it's, it's very, very mixed now, including not just Guatemala and El Salvador as resource countries, but also Ecuador and I mean moving into South South America. Do you think 
they played a role in rejuvenating oh, absolutely. Greenport absolutely. and the economy and just providing more. Well, uh, Dave Capel said to me at one point, they, they really saved the village. Maybe that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but they certainly, I mean, they, as, as the developments around the park and other institutions um, occurred, the need for the lower level, low income, Mm -hmm. jobs grew and um, the people who filled those jobs were not going to be local kids, um, local young people, although some were, but that was the opportunity, I think. And the <laughs> demand the demand for that kind of labor grew. Yes. And I think, you know, the Hispanic community has been accepted here because primarily because it's useful. And now since the 90s and into the 2000s and 2010s, and now we're in 20, the 2020s, do you see there's obviously a change in since the pandemic with housing prices and with different socioeconomic groups moving in, whether from the city, and is that pushing out people that would have immigrated here Previously. Absolutely. Well, s several things have happened. One is that um, uh, some of the Hispanic families have moved from Greenport west uh, just a little bit to Southold mm -hmm. or Mattituck. Um, when we first moved here, there were very few kids in the Southold in Southold High School, for example, yes. who were from those families. Um, I don't know how many there are now, but I do know that uh, in, say, 2018, probably the last time I had a long conversation with people in the South Old High School about this, there were lots and lots of Hispanic kids, and some of them were people who had just arrived. So that's one thing, that, that there's been a spreading of of people who would have been more likely to be in Greenport um, 20 years ago. But also uh, the rise in prices here has definitely pushed people out. One of the students that I teach English to was in fact told by her landlord recently that uh, he wanted to improve the apartment where she was, uh, renovate it and rent it to somebody who would be, you know, some New Yorker who wanted to be here on weekends. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> upper middle class yes. person. So I think there have been a number of reasons that there's been a shift in the demographics. Something, but another question that I think you probably want an answer to is what has happened to the families who came, say, in the 90s and who, I mean, something that that is very evident is that it, it isn't and wasn't just single males looking for work. It was yes. people who, f f you know, family formation occurred mm -hmm. and starting starting in the 90s. And I see now a difference in the kinds of jobs that the Hispanic community has here, mm -hmm. um, which is quite exciting, but it's not really far enough. The you know the the dishwashers, the the, the young people are not just dishwashers anymore. They're no. and they're not just bus boys, bus persons. Mm -hmm. They're waiters and. Um, assistants and it's a it's a much you know there is a a generational shift which is for the better yes um probably not enough but it's not enough but better <laughs> and even some have their own businesses that oh, they yes. started up and yes um, i mean landscaping businesses i think there chris moore in 
Southall is the only landscaping business I can think of that isn't doesn't have a Hispanic name. So what do you see with the changes going on now? How do you see the future of, I guess, specifically Greenport? Because I, obviously there's people moving to Riverhead or people might be going upstate. What do you see the future and do you see the, a decrease in immigration here? Well, the census, the 2020 census is different from the 2010 census <laughs> yes. in that respect. There, yes. the, the proportion of those who identify as Hispanic <clears throat> is smaller than it was. But um, the overall population is growing. Yes. Um, I, I think it's, it's hard to look, it's hard to tell what's going to happen yes. in the future because the housing crisis the housing situation is a real crisis and i worry that we're going to become you know we're going to have what sister margaret called the trade parade you yeah. know people who who will not be part of the community but will mm -hmm. just come in to work here and go out i went to have a manicure in um Mattituck recently and i was there before the store opened and as I was waiting for it to open, and there was no one inside, I mean, no workers inside, a van drove up and out poured eight young women who were the manicurists. Yes. They had been driven from Queens to wow. work in Mattituck. Wow. I felt as though they were Asian, probably Chinese, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but I worry that that's a pattern that we're going to see in Greenport with the Hispanic community. Just people commuting all mm -hmm. this way. From very to long just, distances, yeah. Yeah. And hopefully it doesn't, we don't mimic the South for <laughs> like the Hamptons in some respects. But you also mentioned that you are involved with the zoning and land. Yes, I'm in the zone. I'm on the zoning board of zoning appeals board for the village of for the village of, of Greenport. Um, we are meeting this very evening, and and I'm on the code committee that is working on um, changes in the village code, which are intended not to um, not to prohibit commercial mm -hmm. development, but to regulate it more strictly so that we don't. Well, you know, there are various bogey, bogey town uh, comparisons made. The worry is we don't want to become like Montauk, but we don't want to become like Sag Harbor either. <laughs> yes. And uh, so, you know, I think that our job on the zoning board and the planning board and at the legislative level with the five members of the board of the of the board of trustees in Greenport is to figure out just the right balance where you mm -hmm. encourage small business both businesses that support the tourist economy and those that support the maritime economy mm -hmm. which is shrunk of course considerably we have to find a balance between mm -hmm. support of those small enterprises and rec recognizing that people want to come here for mm -hmm. the best of reasons and we want to encourage them to come here. So zoning is a crucial part of figuring out how to strike that balance. And you feel that while you've been on the, the zoning board and do you feel that Greenport is able to not, I don't know if preserve is the right word, but make sure that Greenport can keep some of its character characteristics and not become just like another yeah, town. I, yeah, I think zoning has something to do with that. I think the planning board is more important than the zoning board in mm -hmm. terms of, um, of finding projects that, uh, encouraging projects that will um, enhance the community and um, enable a housing renaissance that includes spaces that 
are good for renters. Yeah. And we we need that. Um, yeah, I I think I think we can do it. I think it requires political will. Will it also re requires community participation? And I think it's terrific that in the recent months, you know, in in March there was really a a kind of realignment politically in mm -hmm. of this little village. We have three of the five board members who are new. Yes. Um, and a new mayor who is thinking deeply, I think, about how to um, regulate development, commercial development in good ways. And, and starting now to think also about what we can do with the housing districts. Um, that's a zoning question in part and a, and a planning question also. Um, to make things like um, accessory dwelling units, that is, you know, the, the extra room or the extra, um, or using your garage or who knows. I, I don't know what the, <laughs> yeah. what the units would be like, but the idea of having um, additional resources that are housing resources that are available to renters and to small families and you know we ne we need to do all of that just and i think if we don't do that we will be like montauk or sag Harbor. just very kind of just yeah homogenization mm -hmm. or just yeah very similar to other places that doesn't stick out and mm -hmm. have unique characteristics of the town but i wanted to just mention one other thing You've created a website called Small Town Immigration mm -hmm. Information Clearinghouse. What exactly is that website about? Well, it's it's about um, the. I want people to know that there are not just immigrant influxes in big cities, mm -hmm. but in small towns as well, and that immigrants are often revitalizing small towns some mm -hmm. of the places where they're where that's clearest are in the most unlikely states like minnesota and mm -hmm. and iowa and um there are a lot of little towns in iowa that have suddenly got you know three mexican restaurants yes <laughs> <laughs> and and other kinds of businesses that have have saved the towns. And Greenport, you know, I should probably mention that I once counted five businesses on Front and Main, Front Street, Front and Main Streets, that were owned or managed by immigrants, yes. some of whom are still undocumented. I mean, it's really extraordinary. Mm -hmm. The yeah. lack of documentation is certainly a an overwhelming problem for the immigrant community mm -hmm. but it hasn't kept it from Them. significant successes yes no that's that's it's amazing and um i think we might have to wrap it up yeah there with that but i i want to thank you so much for coming on and obviously i definitely want to have you back on again because we could definitely talk more about things going on in Greenport, immigration and other mm -hmm. issues. But it was definitely really interesting to hear about your life growing up and how you came to New York and eventually came out to the North Fork. And thank you for bringing information about the immigration immigrants out here, especially the Hispanic community. And um, thank you for everything you're doing for the community out here. Thank you very much. I love Greenport and I I think I'm very lucky to have such a wonderful place to retire in. I mean, I don't feel very retired sometimes because there's so much in Greenport to do. Well, I hope you all enjoyed episode nine with Denny Gordon. I want to thank you again for listening to the Floyd Memorial Library podcast, and we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.